to our good news program. We're so thankful that you've tuned in. Aren't you excited over these lessons? They are the very best lessons to know our inheritance in Christ. And once again, we're going to ask, are you ready for the rapture? If the Lord should come today, would you be taken up or would you be left behind? This is the Shekinah glory of God. And Christ is coming in a cloud to take us to be with him and we're going to receive a body of light. And those that's left on the earth are going through the awful, awful, terrible times that we read about in Revelation chapter six, beginning in chapter six. And if you don't know these first seven seals, you must understand that we are in the last, last days. The killings of one another is all that I have to mention. I don't even have to mention all the other things that are happening. All of the things that Christ said was going to happen are happening today. But let's look at our inheritance. He says, I've overcome the world. Be of good cheer in the world. You shall have tribulation. This is John chapter 16, verse 33. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So since we're going to be talking about Today, we're finished with the joy that we have in Christ, our inheritance. We're going to be talking next about the Holy Spirit. So we're going to be reading in John chapter 16, beginning in verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for me that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. But if I depart, I shall send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin of, and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they believe not on me and of righteousness because I go to my father. This is what he has for us as true believers. We must understand that he says, and you will see me no more. You see, he was going to leave them. But before he was going to the cross, he's given us all of his inheritance written down before he leaves. And this is how we can have joy. And then he said of judgment because the prince of the world is judged. That is the Antichrist. And we know where his final abode is, the lake of fire, the prince of the world, and that is Satan. And then in verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. You see, that's one of the things we must understand is the Spirit of God teaches us all things. So I have seven things in verse 13 and 14 that the Spirit of God is going to do. First of all, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truths. That's why, without being born again, the Spirit of God, he, he, you have no Spirit of God to teach you these truths. He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of himself. You see, this is where many people are confused. He says to worship in spirit and in truth. So the Spirit can't work apart from the word of God. He will teach you all things. He will guide you. Now see the spirit don't speak of himself. You see Christ came to make known and manifest the father. The Holy Spirit came to make known and manifest Jesus Christ. It's all about him. 
And then he says, but whatsoever he shall hear the word of God, that shall he speak. That's number three. Number four, and he will show you things to come. That's where we get our future. That's how we know because it's in this book. He has everything for us. You either go to heaven or you go to hell. That's the future. There is no in between. And this is why the Spirit of God teaches us. And then he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. And all things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. And then we come to verse 20. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned to joy. And then verse 22, and ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again. You see, I go to prepare a place for you. It, all of these follow one another. Every, every inheritance that we have. He's going to see us again, and we're going to rejoice. And listen what he says in verse 22. But no man taketh your joy from you. This is his joy. Nobody can take this from us. And then he said, once again, our Bible verse, and you need to memorize this, John 16, 24, this is what he says. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name, once again, his name, ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. And no one can take that joy from us as true believers. This is his word. Let's pray. Oh, our gracious and dear heavenly Father, Words cannot express our thanksgiving to thee of all that we have in Christ. I pray for every person that's listening today that they may know this joy, they may know this peace and this love and humility. Oh, Heavenly Father, the Spirit of God gives us humility. We thank thee and praise thee for these truths. We pray that every person that's listening today, as we sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, may realize how rich we are in Christ. Save every person that's listening. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now we say Christ's name because, see, Jesus is his earthly name. And we call him Christ now because that's his heavenly name. And he is in heaven. So here we saw last week how our joy has, is full. No one can take. What is this joy with which our Lord would bring our joy to the full? This is his joy. I have his joy. And this is the most important thing, that these are all his, that he has left for us. The unfailing source from which our Savior drew his joy was his close intimacy with his heavenly Father. You see, that's why if you have sin in your life, you have no fellowship with Christ, and that severs your fellowship, that sin does. He continually enjoyed the sweet sense of Christ's love. That's what we're to do, to love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. He kept walking in his perfect will, his heavenly Father's perfect will. You see, that's what he says to us, that we are not to be unwise, but knowing what the will of God is for us. He found his satisfaction in doing the work that his Father had appointed him to do. What about you? What, how do you find your labor of love? Is it a joy? If it's not, then you're not doing the will of God. Bask in the consciousness that his Father, dwelling in him, you see the abiding presence of God, we must always know that, he, that he, that Christ, was speaking his words and doing his work through him. 
You see, this is the joy that I have. I know giving out his word, it will not return void. I know that I'm doing the work that he's called me to do. There's no greater joy in the world. The Lord's earthly life, the fountain from which his spirit was sustained, was an unfailing joy. And, and I say this all the time, I know I live the abundant life. This bequest that he has left to us is closely linked with the foregoing one in, is the key to the other. Every one of these is the key to the other one that we're talking about. In the abiding life, our Lord is bequesting to us a relationship with himself. If I have not been born again, I do not have any fellowship with Christ. Correspondent to his relationship that he enjoyed with his father. My relationship, that's why when you're born again, you have a relationship. We're one in Christ. What the father was to him, he is henceforth to be to us. And by the same token that he was to the Father, we are to be to him. We are. Likewise, the love he enjoyed from the Father, we are to enjoy from him. And this will be our experience as we, like our Lord, abide and obey. There can, you see, it's impossible to please, for without faith, it's impossible to please God. The strongest thing in the world is our faith. And if you're not living by faith, that's the first thing. You can't please the Lord. But then you have to abide in him. That means confess my sins all confessed and living by faith. How simple the secret of his joy made ours. It is not happiness that our Lord left with us. That is something outward on the surface, while joy is personal deep down in the soul. The early Christians and all of their persecutions, thousands of them that died in the face of great terror, even great torture, even the disciples were martyred and through their, these early saints, when they experienced this awful torture, they had an exuberant joy that amazed their tormentors. Remember Paul and Silas when they were, he said they were counted worthy to suffer for his sake. That's how we are to do. Drawn into a closer intimacy, by their trials, they experience from their living, the Lord ministered unto them in such a vital union of joy that amazed those that were their tormentors. We are to love those that hurt us. We just read that's one of the requirements of love. Have you received this bequest? Are you maintaining the relationship that enables him to live through you? Your joy to others. Is your joy filling the cup of your joy to the full to others? Is his joy filling the cup of your joy to others, to the full? John seventeen thirteen that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Now this is verse 8, his spirit. John chapter 16, 7 through 15. We just read that at the beginning. The gift of the Holy Spirit is for holiness. Now our Lord is prepared to make the great disclosure that his going from them is the key to the Spirit's coming to them. Unspeakable benefits. This is what he has. To them, from the Spirit's coming, his going was 
so declared to them that it was expedient that he should go and leave them. But the Spirit of God is going to be their comforter. He is everything that we need. Jesus had been but a presence with them and must always have remained so. But now the Spirit is coming to be a presence within. He had the outward appearance with them. Now we have the abiding presence. The Spirit's coming into their hearts. They were to become transformed men. Every person that's listening today, if you claim to be a child of God, now remember, being a Christian is not being born again. To say you are a Christian, you must be born again by the Spirit of God or you cannot be a Christian because a Christian means that Christ is in me, the hope of glory. And now the Spirit's coming into their hearts that's what he is teaching them that he's going to do, that the Spirit of God is going to be the one that's going to do this. What the Spirit is given for is embodied in the name used of our Lord. He is a comforter for us. This includes the work of witnessing of which the Spirit is the source. You see, when the Spirit of God came, this is, you must know this truth, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and into the uttermost part of the earth. Now this actually happened in chapter 4 of the book of Acts. It began in Judea. Chapter 8 of, in the book of Acts, it went to Samaria. And then from Cornelius in chapter 10 all the way up to where we are living today, this is the Spirit of God and He's the one that gives us power to witness. And if you haven't been born again, you know nothing of joy. The truth that Jesus has already spoken, the truth that he has in reserve for us, especially does he minister the things of Christ and makes himself real. You must know the abiding presence of God. Every person that's listening, that's the only way that you are going to have joy to know this doctrine of the abiding presence. This is our Lord's chief legacy, the best of his goods. This is what he has left. His spirit, moreover, is his master bequest. It is he who enables us to experience all the other inheritance, the bequest that we have had. How shall we live out his humility or his love? Only by his spirit. And remember, the spirit is for holiness. How shall we hold to the hope of his heavenly home and his coming for us? Only by his spirit. How shall his peace possess our hearts and minds? Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Our minds continually, only by his spirit. This mind be in you. How shall we live the abiding life? Only by his spirit. For he is the sap, the vital flow of life in the vine and the branch relationship, his life. You see, it's not my life anymore that I live, but it's his life. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. How shall his joy flood our souls even in the difficult days that we're living in? Only by his spirit. Have you received this bequest? On the authority of God's word, you have if you are 
his own. Now, we need to go to Romans 8, verse 14. Romans 8, verse 14. You must memorize these verses. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And then you can read all the way down. If, well, uh, let, let's read verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage, again, to fear. Remember, all fear comes from Satan. If you're a child of God, none of these things that's happening on the earth move you because fear is Satan's tool. But you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. You see, we can call him Father. And verse 16, the spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the sons of God. And if children, now here's another heir that we have. These are the truths of God's word. Verse 17 of Romans 8, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. If so be this, we suffer with him that we also may be glorified together with him. This is his word. This is the most exciting thing in the world. But are you realizing it? Have you so yielded your heart and life to him that he is proven himself a quickening spirit, strengthening, beautifying, and transforming presence of God? Three times in Ephesians, he tells us about the fullness that we have. Ephesians 3.19, the fullness of the power of God, the fullness of the Lord, Ephesians 4.13, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. For the believer, this is the fullness that he desires for us. This means a completeness of what he has for every true servant of God. You see, this world today is full of trouble. Believers should be full of joy. We're the light of the world. In the darkest days, we're to, our light is to shine brighter. It will take eternity to compare and comprehend all that he is to us. The Holy Spirit who gave us this prayer wants God's people to know more of Christ, to feed on him, and by knowing the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, to be filled with all the fullness of God. Now this is in Ephesians. This is what he tells us in the book of Ephesians. To know the fullness of God, think of all the dimensions of that love. This is amazing love. This is in Revelation, I mean Ephesians 3, beginning in verse 18, that we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of God which passes knowledge. You see, I've taught these for 30 years, and I can never express to you the greatest love that he has for us. It is an everlasting love. He loves those he, he died for his enemies, and we are to love our enemies. And now, this is what he think of all of this, the dimensions of his love. Come unto me, all that is the breadth of his love. The length is from eternity to eternity. His love has no beginning and no end. It is eternal love. Now, for those of you that know that we're not going to get through all of these inheritance this week, but we will continue with them next week. The first three chapters of the book of Revelation teaches us what the Godhead has done for the believer. The Lord is trying to humble us. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. All that has happened and will happen is because of him. What the Godhead has done for us, God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Number two, he's chosen us before the foundation of the world. He's predestinated us unto the adoption of children.
praise to the glory of his grace. That's what God the Father has given to us. And now, what Jesus has done for us. He has redeemed us. He has forgiven us of our sins. He's given us an inheritance. Praise to his glory. What the Holy Spirit has done for us. He sealed our salvation. He's given us the earnest, the down payment. He sealed us till the day of redemption. The Spirit of God can never leave our body. He is a personality. He feels and knows and wills. That's why the Spirit of God must come in. And next week, we'll learn more about the Spirit of God that you must know. And this is, he sealed us till the day of redemption and the praise of his glory. You see, the devil don't have the power to break that seal. He sealed us. That's a down payment. It's signed and sealed. No law can break that inheritance. Nothing can break this inheritance that he has. Not only because of sonship, we're a child of God, but also by adoption. Adoption cannot be broken. That's before the law. Sonship is established by the Father. The law established the sonship of adoption. So therefore, by the Father and by the law, we receive the inheritance. If Christ is glorified, then I'm going to be glorified. If he is alive, I too shall live. I've been adopted by the law, therefore it's legal. Therefore, it belongs to me. You see, you don't need any inheritance. You don't need anything in this world. This is all ours. Why Jesus has no human father. Why he had no human father. But he had a legal father. The legal father gave him the rights and privileges under the law. The heavenly father gave him the rights and privileges under his love. What an inheritance. Call upon the Lord Jesus Christ to save you today. This is what we have in Christ. And we have just begun. We're going to see his victory. And we know that when we see his victory, he came to destroy the works of the devil. And then we're going to see his prayer in John chapter 17. Those of you that are listening, are you ready for the rapture? This is going to be our theme throughout until the Lord comes. You must know Christ as Savior. Thank you for tuning in. Tune in again next week. Thank you.